Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by co-host Eric Ibarra and also returning guest, Dr. Jared Goff, a professor at uh, St. Cyril and Methodius Byzantine Catholic Seminary. Uh, welcome to the show again. How are you, Dr. Goff? I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, good to be with you guys. Absolutely. I, I always love having you on because I learn a lot the entire time. And then I go back and rewatch it and learn more. So <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming back on and talking to us again. We're talking uh, today about the uh, Franciscan understanding of the filioque. So let me maybe just start out and uh, maybe ask you, um, could you maybe just give us an introductory understanding of what, what exactly is the filioque? Um, and then maybe some of the Franciscan nuances of it. Well, I, basically, the filioque is the, the teaching that the person of the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father, either and the Son or through the Son. And this is uh, basically a doctrine that is attempting to preserve the fullness and reality and perfection of the communication of the divine nature to the person of the Son. Um, and thereby drawing out the implications if there is a taxis of persons and it's truly the father that is the father of the spirit and thus spirates the spirit uh there's going to be an order of persons and there's thus going to be an order of terminations I, here i'm speaking logically i'm not speaking temporally or spatially but there will be an order of terminations of the persons and if one says simply that <clears throat> the father spirates the spirit well that implies that he must be father and the constitutive property or characteristic of the father is paternity and that's explained through uh what uh catholic theologians in common will call the generation through the mode or according to the mode of nature of the son and that generation is a communication of the father to the son as uh an image um and likeness and then the 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 holy spirit is spoken of as spirating or proceeding from the Father. And um, this is simply referring to the Holy Spirit proceeding via the mode of will um, from the Father uh, and the Son or through the Son, terminating in a third person uh, according to uh, or through the mode of, of will and being called um, uh, the notion of gift or datum, whereas the Son is spoken of as born or natum, the, the, the Holy Spirit is spoken of as gift, datum, or nexus, or bond of the Father and the Son. And so uh, basically that's the, that's the doctrine. The attempt really is to preserve both two, two sides of, of an equation. One, the priority, the aseity, the unoriginateness of the Father but yet affirm that there is, in terms of this taxis of persons and a natural order of operations, uh, that the taxes of persons through what will be called the originative acts, namely via intellect and will, um, wants to preserve that if the father generates the son, and in order to be father must generate the son, then if the father spirates the spirit, that son will A, possess that same nature and thus the same originative power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the spirit as the father, but in the mode of receiving the essence from the Father, and thus this notional or originate, originative act from the Father, and um, also preserving the taxes of persons. Namely, there is a priority of Father uh, to Son to Spirit uh, that is uh, being discussed here. So a, a couple of points is one, preserving the priority of the Father, and two, preserving the unity of essence uh, between Father and Son within this uh, revealed order of persons, namely Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, let me also ask this. Why, why do we even need to speak about the filioque? Why can't we just say that, look, uh, the way that we distinguish between <clears throat> the Father and the Son, I'm sorry, the Son and the Holy Spirit is by generation and spiration. And that we, we don't really understand what the difference is, but we just take it by faith that there is a difference. Um, why, why isn't that good enough? Why do we need the filioque? Well, you know, the, it, it depends on what system of theology, namely uh, the Thomistic or the Franciscan system that you're arguing from. Um, if you look at the Franciscan system, because uh, the notion of or origins or emanations, namely the mode of origination and emanation according to uh, intellect or according to will, um, when you have 
in God, uh, a perfect nature with perfect um, productive acts at intro. If these acts are of a perfect nature and a perfect act and originate from the Father and terminate in the one divine being that the Father is communicating, these two modes of origination uh, could be known to be sufficient to distinguish the two terminations as distinct persons. And so if one were to argue, say, counterfactually that the Holy Spirit did not proceed from the, from the Son, one could still argue on the basis of the distinct modes of origination, namely generation, spiration, or uh, via the natural mode or intellectual mode and voluntary mode, that the two terms would be distinct, both from the Father and as distinct terms from the Father, distinct from each other. Uh, <clears throat> But the reason why one, according to the Franciscan system, even granting the counterfactual, and you know, it sounded to me like you were quoting uh, St. John of Damascus. Uh, if one granted the counterfactual that the, the Holy Spirit did not proceed from or through the Son, uh, it would still raise the question of the true toxies of persons. Do you have uh, the Father as Father spirating the Spirit? And if the Father as Father is spirating the, the Spirit, it does seem then that there is an order in terms of communication and termination. And thus, if the Father as Father spirates the Spirit, it's not according to or primarily or uniquely according to the proper characteristic of fatherhood because the proper characteristic of fatherhood is simply filiation or um, generation, active filiation. And the Spirit of the Son is passive filiation or being generated. So thus, then you have the Father must in some sense be terminating his act his personal characteristic as the original person and source and cause of the entire Trinity. This act of paternity seems to imply a termination in the Son in order to uh, clearly designate him, not just as a generic or general hypostasis, but as the person of the Father in terms of and in virtue of the generation of the Son, because we're already predicating that the Spirit is spirated and does proceed from the Father. But if you grant then this taxis of persons, it seems then to indicate that whatever the Father has, he communicates to the Son. And <clears throat> whatever the Father has, except for paternity, uh, he would communicate to the Son. So thus the perfect being, and thus every perfection and act of the Father would also be therefore communicated to the Son. And because there is an order or taxis of persons, then that communication of the Son, of the divine being and its perfections to the Son would then seemingly indicate that the Son is in a position relative uh, in, in the logical order to the to the procession of the Spirit, uh, he's in a position to also possess this power of production or spiration with respect to the, the Spirit in a state of quasi-potency to the actual production of the Spirit. So thus, the Son would be as receiving the divine being and all its perfections and operations ad intra from the Father in a relative position of... Um, priority to the spirit insofar as he possesses from the father that perfection of essence and thus the power of spiration with respect to the spirit so the son is the first termination of the two perfect internal productive acts of the father and there's an order to these productive acts one is generation via the mode of nature the other one is uh spiration via the mode of will, and there's a certain order between these two operations. Thus, the, the issue with the filioque is not so much whether or not the father is a sufficient principle, or the son for that matter, to produce a third person. It's rather um, understanding the taxis of person and the nature of the communication of the divine being from the father to the son, and thus from the father in and through the son to the spirit. Uh, not as uh, two principles, but as both possessing that one, shall we say, energetic power of spiration, the originative act of spiration itself, the son would possess as coming from the father and terminating in the spirit. Uh, another, a, 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 an important point to, I think, bring in at this, at, at this point is that <clears throat> with, with the Franciscan tradition, there's a, a, a radical affirmation of the, the, Inatiability, the unbegottenness of the Father. Uh, the Father is uniquely from himself and from no other. 
And also then, if that's stated negatively, the Father is also then the fontal plenitude. These are Bonaventurian terms of the entire Trinity. And when you think then about the manner in which the Franciscan tradition emphasizes the priority of the Father, they would say that the Father is Father because he generates. He doesn't generate because he is Father. So thus you're, you're putting uh, a notion of a person standing in relative priority to terms of his actions, the actions which he carries out through his essential and energetic powers with respect to the communication of the divine being to the son and to the spirit. But nevertheless, this person has a certain priority. And so there's a, there's, there's a, a notion of a Greek emphasis on the priority and aseity, the unique principle of the Trinity is the father. And the father is uniquely in possession of the divine being from no one else whereas the son possesses it according to and through generation and the spirit through uh, spiration. Um, so that's an important point is that there's this emphasis on the priority of the father. The second important point is that the Franciscans borrow, and so does uh, St. Thomas himself, he borrows the notion of Aristotle that in any spiritual creature or any spiritual being rather, um, there are two perfect modes of procession. One is according to intellect, which is a natural mode, wherein uh, the intellect is informed by its object. Uh, it, if, we, if we talk about it in human terms, we would say the intellect is informed by its object, such as a proposition two plus two equals four. Uh, the proposition acts upon, or the object of the intellect acts upon the intellect and thereby informs it. The action is not free. Whereas the other mode of operation is according to will, which is primarily understood according to a mode that is spontaneous. And this will take important uh, root in the Franciscan traditions, working out uh, an important subtlety of distinction between the Franciscan understanding of will and the later Dominican, more thoroughly Aristotelian understanding of will. But so, so the Franciscan then is trying to integrate a Greek emphasis on the priority of the father, which I think is also Augustinian, uh, as well as the Aristotelian notion of two perfect spiritual modes of production in which a spiritual being operates according to nature and according to will. And then finally, they also appropriate the Augustinian language of the created image of God having the three powers of memory, intellect, and will. And this is important because through this psychological or rather metaphysical analogy of the uh, Trinity, according to the spiritual powers of the created person, the created image, we then find that there is an appropriation. There is an appropriate usage of these different powers identical to the one soul, but different in their mode of activity namely memory, intellect, and will, to the persons of Father, Son, and Spirit. And I think what's, what's really here is that's important to consider and that is lost on, on, on many is that there is a primordial, um, there's a primordial disposition, an inherent disposition in the faculty of memory to both uh, generate and speak a word, but also in and through that act of generation and speaking to love the truth that that word represents or that word terminates in. And I think what's important here to, to realize is that perfect memory is the source and both equally, although terminating in a certain order, both equally originate from the, what Bonaventure and Scotus following Augustine will call the fecund memory. Uh, so, so memory flowers into or, or branches out into an act of intellect terminating in understanding or the speaking of a word and an act of love but there's a certain order one cannot love or will that which uh one does not know but nevertheless the important point here is is with the psychological analogy memory itself is the sole and exclusive principle and originator of both intellect and will and when there these these powers of the soul and their order of operation and termination are understood appropriated to the Son and the Spirit, then you find then that memory speaks a word, memory speaks a word because or in order to understand, and this is a termination of its act as natural understanding. But in that same primordial moment, 
in which intellect or memory is moving into intellect, you have at the same time in and through and with intellect, the power of love or volition originating at the same time simultaneously and then through the termination and understanding, then a further termination in uh, seeking union or seeking to love the good that the intellect articulates or, or declares with respect to memory. So the point here is, is that the, the, if you're talking about personal causality or origin, uh, according to the Franciscan tradition, memory contains the origin and solely the origin in this radical sense of both intellect and volition and thus by appropriation, both the originating cause of the spirit as well as the sun, although because of the sun terminates as a natural act appropriated to intellection prior to uh, volition, then the sun will then not be an intermediary as though not uniting two extremes that are opposed or two extremes through time or two extremes spatially separated, but rather simply by the fact of being the first term possessing that same essence that the father communicates with and through the termination of the, the son also will then further terminate in the person of the spirit. But the father here is the sole origin. So if you distinguish then between origin and termination, you will find that the, the father is the unique sole origin of both generation and procession, but yet this procession in terms of the power to spirate is communicated from the son, from the father to the son in the very act that the act of generation terminates in a kind of uh, quasi ontological order as sonship from the father prior to the termination of spirit. And so that's, you know, in kind of a nutshell, this is what is uh, at issue with the Franciscan understanding of the filioque. It's it's not so much primarily to account for um, the distinction of persons according to subsisting reasons, or uh, uh, excuse me, subsisting of relations, but rather um, in terms of understanding the taxis of persons and the order of the originative acts and then preserving this unity in terms of the flourishing or flowing out of the father into the son and through the son uh, finally terminating the holy spirit so if you distinguish between origin and termination you can easily detect then that for the franciscan tradition the sole origin of the trinity and the radical origin of the trinity truly is the father so the father possesses and is god uniquely because the son has divinity in the mode of being generated and the, the spirit has divinity in the mode of being spirated. Uh, so, so I think those are the issues. One, the priority and primacy of the father. Two, the two perfect modes of procession. And then three, uh, the appropriation of the psychological or metaphysical analogy of the Trinity. All three of those are working uh, in the, the general Franciscan approach. I have several um, <clears throat> follow-up questions. Number one, you talked about God has two distinct internal productive acts that come from two modes of operation, namely the intellect and the will. Yeah. Um, yeah and this is, you know, very, very, as, as you're noting, this is coming from Augustine. But uh, I guess my question would be, um, how can we actually speak about these two modes of operation, namely intellect and will uh, within God? What gives us uh, the ability to actually say that there is such a distinction in God? Well, I think I'm, in the first place, uh, you know, St. John of Damascus will say in um, the De Fide Orthodoxa, uh, what is it, book one, chapter eight, that generation is a natural act and it's according to nature. Uh, well, if you have a natural act and it doesn't terminate uh, outside of the, of the being mm -hmm. in which the act is occurring, then that act must be spiritual. And okay. so this helps. So, okay, so it must have a, a certain mode of operation. It's natural. It's, it's, it's acting according to nature and it's achieving a certain end according to the nature that um, is acting or under consideration. But if God is spirit and the action can neither be physical or material, nor can it be ad extra with respect to this notion, then it, hel then it, then it helps to uh, consider, well, what other kinds of spiritual beings do we know? And how do we then understand these spiritual acts uh, in terms by analogy of the, uh, of the divine acts according to nature and according mm -hmm. to will? And this is where the uh, Augustinian 
uh, psychological analogy of the Trinity is, is that we discover in and through and by virtue of the internal acts of the created person, a distinction according to both mode and um, <clears throat> termination or production, if, if for lack of a better term. We find then that, well, intellection is according to a power it's a spiritual power because we all under, uh, engage in it. Intellection is according to a natural mode of activity wherein the object of that power informs that object and in a sense creates a likeness of that object uh, in the mode in which the intellect can receive it. So in a finite intellect, of course, any act of knowledge, uh, there, there's, there is uh, the process through which the likeness is achieved and then there's a representation, but the, the very process and the representation is such that it occurs along the lines of, and in, in, in terms of a, a kind of causal uh, directionality from the object being considered to the power. So, you know, when I see, when I see uh, a tree outside, I, I'm looking at the tree and I'm not willing that the tree be tree, rather the, the tree is operating upon my senses and then my intellect in conjunction with my senses is arriving at a certain uh, internal word or concept, a representation of that tree. And the tree is in a sense, the primary controller in that termination. And this is what we call a natural uh, mode of activity. But we also find in the same uh, spiritual soul, created, created spiritual soul, a voluntary power. And the primary distinction then between a natural mode of activity and a voluntary mode of activity is precisely the, the relation of the power, namely intellect, will, natural, voluntary, to the object. So thus, when I see a tree and I'm really concerned about knowing the truth of the tree, and I have a true conception of the tree intellectually, then my will spontaneously can affirm to accept and approve that tree, to take delight in that tree. And then the position of my will with respect to that tree is one of spontaneity. Uh, it's, it's not determined by its object, rather it determines itself with respect to the object. And so the fundamental difference then is that uh, a, a natural mode of activity is one that wherein the object takes primacy, and a, sp a voluntary act is where the power or the will takes a certain primacy or spontaneity with respect to its response to the object. Now, looking in in God, then we can see well in 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 God there. If he's a spiritual being, there's going to be analogously two kinds of activities that will probably roughly map on to the created image. Why? Well, because we're the created image, and insofar as we're spiritual, we're an image of that eternal. Uh, divinity, but also uh, the tri-person, um, tri-personal nature of that divinity. And so through various distinctions, we can then apply these perfections both to the divinity as such, but more importantly, uh, to the order or taxis of persons. And once we understand these two modes of operation in any spiritual being, we can come up with a general definition, perhaps, of what uh, an intellectual nature is. Uh, an intellectual nature is a spiritual nature endowed with the power of intellection or uh, volition. And thus, if there is going to be um, productions, because we understand that the internal acts in a creature and a created rational being are according to intellect and will in which there are certain productions. One is namely a concept or an inner word or an understanding according to nature or uh, production of love or union with the object that is represented by our understanding, we can see that, well, if God is a, if God is a spiritual nature and he creates rational creatures according to the model of his own perfection, if there are to be uh, productions in God, well, there are probably going to be productions according to these two types, one according to nature, one according to um, volition or the voluntary mode and then this is allows for further analysis to say on the basis also of revelation because there'd be no way to prove this unless god positively stated it uh that well yes god does generate a son and a son is a likeness and a likeness is produced according to a natural mode of activity and the spirit is uh, a kind of bond it is a kind of community uh, it, it's a kind of uh instantiated uh relationship between different things according to the mode of love. 
And so this is this is I think how the reasoning works. So why why uh, say that we you know we we should just stick with generation inspiration? I think that's an adequate answer. And I think because of the uh, the Franciscan emphasis on the possibility, the counterfactual possibility of saying, well, you know, if the Holy Spirit doesn't proceed from the Son, it doesn't follow that you're denying the Trinity, something that uh, St. Thomas held because he understood subsisting opposed relations to be the sole constitutive element of uh, divine personhood. If you If you say, well, modes of emanation can also do this work. You would not necessarily be a heretic by denying the Trinity uh, if you denied the Filioque. You would be either in some sort of state of theological error or you would be heretical insofar as you denied uh, the defined dogma of the Filioque and there would be certain uh, theological and philosophical problems that would ensue. And the Franciscan would speak of this, namely in, in terms of, again, if you, have, if you affirm a taxis of persons and you say this the spirit uh, is the spirit of the father or the father spirates the spirit. Well, then the father must be father when he spirates or he must be able to be understood in some sense as father in his very act of spiration. And the sole characteristic or the property of fatherhood is generation or active filiation, not spiration. Um, and so that's one point that the Franciscans would want to bring up. And the other point would simply be that, um, well, actually two points. One is a desire to maintain the unity and the fullness of the communication within the taxis or order of persons uh, from father to son. That's one issue. And then the second issue would be, and this remains a, a difficulty, is that even if you grant that the modes of emanation or modes of origination according to generation and spiration are sufficient, understood in terms of perfection, which would be able to be uh, attributed to God, the father, if you understand that modes of emanation are sufficient to distinguish between persons as distinct terminations, that still doesn't explain the relationship uh, and the distinction at the termination end between father, I mean, between son and spirit. So you might say they go out as two rays from a common source because they go according to different modes. But when those rays terminate in distinct persons, how do those terminations interrelate? Uh, and this is where it becomes more difficult to answer the question if you simply rely on modes of emanation and you have no arising distinction of relation that is certainly helped through the doctrine of the filioque. And this is where St. Thomas really picks up, uh, but he has a sort of different problem because he does not grant with the Franciscans that modes of emanation can be sufficient to terminate indistinct persons. No, he rather says opposing subsisting relations must and be uh, understood as the sole and exclusive reason for the distinction of person. So thus, if the spirit did not proceed from the son, then the spirit would ipso facto not be a distinct person from the son. So for the Franciscans, it's harder to tell at the termination end the difference, but they say, well, there must be a difference. And this is where they would concede with the Orthodox that, yeah, there is a difference, we grant it. But apart from the filioque and the arising subsisting relations, which is a common doctrine to the, 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 the Latin patristic and medieval tradition, it's hard to tell how they're distinct. Whereas St. Thomas would just simply say they can't be distinct. Can you also maybe speak about perhaps uh, Franciscan involvement in the um, position of the Filioque at the Second Council of Lyon. Is, is there maybe um, a Franciscan under, un, understanding of the Filioque uh, taught by the Council? Well, that's a good question. I mean, before we go on, I'm, I, I don't want to just simply be talking in uh, abstractions over the head of the audience. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want to make certain I'm not simply doing that. I'll, you know, I have a tendency to tend towards that. So if, if that is occurring, just be, feel free to interrupt me. I can always, uh, I can always switch PowerPoint slides in my head, you know, mm -hmm. and go back. Sure. So, um, so that was, that was, I, I need to do some more uh, peripatetic, what I heard, uh, knuckle dragging. Uh, so. <laughs> is that, is that what somebody told you? <laughs> somebody <laughs> did tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> knuckle dragging. Good so, stuff, though. But uh, okay, you know that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question historically, and th theologically, there are several several points, um, and I, I I worked up a kind of flowchart with respect to the Second Council of Lyon, 
that suggested that the context was at least as much Bonaventurian Franciscan as it was uh, St. Saint Thomas. Um, and there are several historical contextual considerations to, to consider. It's not a knockdown case, but it certainly is a case that is suggestive. And several, several matters are, are at hand. Um, the, the, the Pope who presided at the Second Council of Lyon was Pope Gregory X. And <clears throat> Pope Gregory X was, as far as I understand, if I rem remember correctly, was both a former student of Bonaventure and uh, also uh, Bonaventure was very influential. There was a, there was a lengthy in, in, uh, interregnum between uh, Gregory X's predecessor and Gregory X himself. And Bonaventure's intervention and advocacy of Gregory X was instrumental in Gregory X's election. So uh, both that uh, filial as well as um, uh, thankful, uh, filial as former student and grateful as assisting his his way to uh, the, the chair of Peter would have made or disposed very likely Gregory X to um, gravitate or at least be perfectly open to uh, Bonaventure's own understanding of the procession of the Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> our second point is that the Franciscans, there were four Franciscans, the most important of which was a certain Jerome of, uh, uh, Jer Jerome of Ascoli. Uh, he was sent with a delegation of three of his confreres, uh, a couple of whom spoke Greek, one I'm certain spoke Greek, to Constantinople about four years before the convening of uh, Leon II. And these four guys were basically, and they were hand selected by Bonaventure because he was instructed either by Gr Gregory X or the, his predecessor to pick four guys to go over to Constantinople and try to broker uh, an understanding of the ecclesiological issues and theological issues then dividing uh, east from west. And so Bonaventure handpicked these four fellows and they're the people who actually hammered out the deal that was in a sense rubber stamped at the Council of Leon. Because the, the Council of Leon, we, have, we don't have the acta, but we have what's called the ordinatio of the council. And basically there was very little discussion. The, the, the deal had already been signed prior to the convocation of the council and the council was just simply there to give it uh, solemnity and ratification. So the, the, the deal or the, the articulation of the filioque, according to uh, this broker deal in Constantinople was carried out by students of Bonaventure who likely would have followed his mindset with respect to the formulation of the deal. And so this is very suggestive that coming back to Constantinople, the deal was brokered by Franciscans who were students of Bonaventure. And as far as I'm understanding, uh, Gregory X certainly he benefited from Bonaventure's patronage with respect to the papacy, but I'm also quite sure that he was a former student. And another important factor is that on the way to the council, of course, everybody knows St. Thomas uh, hit his head uh, on a tree branch and ended up dying, I believe, at a Cistercian monastery, while Bonaventure made it to the council and gave uh, an opening homily in front of the entire delegation, both sides, Latin and Greek, in which he was as the records state, universally praised and lauded. And then he died on July 14th during the course of the council and his funeral homily was preached by the great Dominican and future Pope, whose name is, uh, is, is escaping me, uh, Peter Terensius or something like this. Uh, he, so Bonaventure was a, a powerful figure. He was not just a, a, a former minister general, not just a great scholastic theologian at Paris in the 1250s. Uh, he was not just a minister general of the Franciscan order, he was also a bishop and a cardinal of the church. And he was probably the leading theological figure as well as ecclesiastical figure at the council. So those are important considerations when you think about the formulation of Leon and its declaration on the procession of the spirit as from one principle, not from two. And this and then a, further, a couple further considerations is that uh, Jerome of Ascoli, remember he was the one who was sent to Constantinople to broker the deal around, you know, 1271, uh, 72, maybe a little earlier. He became 10 years later, well, more like, uh, more like 15 years later, in the 1290s, he became Pope Nicholas IV. And this is clearly, uh, a, there were, 
there would be motivation not to be exclusively Franciscan, but clearly to be open to following and advocating for the Franciscan line with respect to uh, particular doctrines, including the procession of the spirit. Uh, another consideration is that while many theologians kind of forgot in between say, and this is this was uh, pointed out by, let me think, I believe uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Schabel uh, on his filioque from Lyon to Florence. And it, an interesting fact is that the filioque in terms of inserting or um, I'm looking for a different word, um, combining the the note the teaching of of Leon Leon two Leon, Leon twelve seventy four into th speculative theology from say twelve seventy four through fourteen thirty eight thirty nine it was mainly Leon two was mainly kind of left to the side many people didn't cite it they cited other texts which kind of incorporated the teaching of Leon but they got confused about dates they got confused about who was pope at the time so it was just not a it wasn't a big issue but you do find many Franciscans and importantly uh, and perhaps most importantly, Dun Scotus specifically holding the line and quoting Leon II in his own formulation around uh, uh, book one of his Ordinatio, which is just a sentence commentary, it's distinction, I think, uh, distinction 11. He's actually quoting from Leon II as though in Franciscan theological and in intellectual culture, Leon II still had importance. And given the, the contextual evidence and the su suggested or suggestive associations between Bonaventure and Gregory X and Nicholas IV and um, Scotus, you, you, it, it might be the case that Leon 1274 was something more emphasized in the Franciscan tradition because it came out of, and it was particularly important and dear to the Franciscans who were involved in that original formulation. And so, you know, Moving all the way down to say the Council of Florence, this might have important historical and theological implications, at least in terms of opening up or broadening discussions, uh, regardless of what say John Montanero had to say and his subordinationism and his false quotations of St. Basil. It still suggests that the eclectic quasi or pseudo Thomism of John of Montanero when he's discussing with Mark Eugenicus, this may be, yes, part of the acta of Florence, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the controlling hermeneutic of Florence, not exclusive of the true St. Thomas and his teaching, which is a, a perfectly obviously permissible position in the Catholic Church, no one would deny it, but also then it could perhaps be a potential way of reframing the definition of Leon and how it affects, because Florence purports to just be repeating Leon, that is very likely or suggestively coming out of a more Bonaventurian and its development through Matthew of Aquasparta, John Peckham, um, John Duns Scotus, uh, it, may, it may be coming out of a more Franciscan uh, intellectual milieu, which could be beneficial in at least furthering, if not resolving, discussions between East and West over the question of the procession of the spirit. Why? We'll go back to those pillars. There's, a, there's an emphasis in the Franciscan tradition on the unique priority of the Father, there's a common em emphasis with uh, both St. Thomas and the Franciscans of the two modes of perfect production internal. And then there's a common but very much more robust application of the Augustinian psychological or metaphysical analogy of the image to the Trinity to help us understand how these conceptual and volitional acts in the created image mirror in a finite and imperfect mode those perfect actions of the Father in and through the sun, terminating the spirit uh, ad intra. And this opens up again a way of saying, well, yeah, we concede that the Father is in the most perfect sense. Bonaventure even says the Son, the Father acts by authority, the Son acts by sub authority, meaning the Father gives him all things. The Father, the Son speaks what the Father gives him to speak. He speaks the Father. And so if you affirm the priority of the Father, and then you can say, well, these modes of origination really are the fundamental determinant of the distinction of persons, even if we still affirm subsisting relations, we can then say, yeah, counterfactually, you're not, a, you're not an anti-Trinitarian heretic if you deny the filioque. You might be a heretic or in theological error for denying the filioque, but you're not a heretic with respect to the Trinity itself, which inexorably comes out of St. Thomas's position because he, again, takes a different tact with respect to the Father. And so 
you know, if if all of this is in place, you know, it, it may be helpful in discuss discussing the filioque issue with uh, Orthodox vis-a-vis -vis Leon II and uh, Florence. I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, because a, a Catholic at that point is not necessarily locked into a Thomistic understanding of the filioque. There, there's room for the SCOTUS position when, when we speak about how we understand the magisterial teachings on the matter. So I think that's, that's right. very helpful that you clarified that. Um, I want to pass it over to Eric to give him a chance to ask some questions here, and I'll, I'll um, you know, follow up on the tail end with some more questions. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Goff. Uh, yeah, your opening segment there was fantastic it, to me. That it was divine. I mean, so perfect. And I just don't know how anybody can put up an explanation like that within ten minute segment. It was just amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I gathered from what you were saying is that the you know one of the because you know, the question comes up and with with the Orthodox with and with with uh, inquirers, why do we talk about the issue of intellection and volition or intellect and will as a uh, a mode of origination within the one being of God? And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a simple way of answering that question would be that divine revelation speaks about one being, God, and that there are three, two of which come out of a first. And so <clears throat> looking at an analogy of within the created order, what do we know has the ability to have this tri I don't want to say tripartite because that's going to that, that's going to create problems going back to the Trinity, but in a in a in, in a spiritual being, you have memory, you have intellect and will, and intellect and will come out of the memory, but they don't go out of the person. It goes back into the same mind. Um, so, would, would you say that that is, you know, trying to find an explanation for how you can have uh, a procession out of one? but returning to the same thing and yet there be distinctions? Yeah, I think I think that is the important insight in the psychological or metaphysical analogy of the Trinity is that it takes really the highest kind of created nature that we know, which is spiritual and which is revealed to be the image, the created image of God. And then it tries to understand by its own internal modes of operation how God could be. And so even though there is a relative imperfection such that the memory, the memory is called the, the, the source of the soul, the, the fecund um, starting point, what Bonaventure calls the apex mentis is really memory in its transcendental, meaning its dependent created relationship on the free creative will act of God. This is really the source of, of rational being. So what Bonaventure speaks of in terms of the rationality of the creature in its very first act of existence, defining what it is, this occurs primarily through the illumination of memory, which then flowers or, or generates a word or a concept. And so here's here's an important thing. And then through that word or a concept or by virtue of that word or concept, then returns to that original source, which is memory, through an act of love. So in the sense, it unites the concept with the source in one being. And so what you have then are three powers or perfections or modes of operation that are not really distinct. So, and this is an important aspect that distinguishes here slightly, well, seriously, from the more Aristotelian philosophical psychology of St. Thomas and the Franciscan philosophical psychology of, say, Bonaventure and Scotus, is that where St. Thomas will say that the soul is the, the form under consideration, and then it has two powers, intellection and volition. And these two powers are what he calls absolute accidents, not really identical with the soul itself. And so it creates a different dynamic. And this is why 
very likely St. Thomas could not use so robustly or wasn't willing to use so so robustly and strongly the psychological analogy that as the Franciscans were because the Franciscans understood that the soul is simply one thing and that we designate or arrive at three distinct, formally distinct powers of the soul by virtue of reflecting upon the soul's own operation by in a sense quasi stepping back objectifying the soul and seeing how it operates well it operates in a natural way forming a concept through uh intellection well where does intellection come from because intellection can't just simply be a phenomenon of sense experience so there must be something primordial well that's memory and then we see well in through intellection there's a flowering of volition spontaneity and so both are then seen back as rooted in memory memory doesn't memory doesn't declare itself just like the father doesn't declare itself except through the son and memory through intellection and that reunification through volition so what we had then for the franciscans at least is we had one substance with three formally distinct modes now the difference here is is because memory is an info is not infinite and doesn't through an infinite act of speaking a word terminate in a distinct infinite person because it's not a perfect communication and there's division there's separation we when we say a word as we say it yes clearly there's a termination but that termination doesn't exhaust uh the 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 reality of the soul it, itself plus when we stop thinking that word we stop saying it and so it's no longer terminating in that word whereas in 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 god the father is by nature pos possessed of infinite in intellect and will and when in that act of production, he, through his perfect knowledge, speaks in a speech act, that knowledge, that terminates, or, or an infinite word, that terminates in a distinct person. But the difference here is that it doesn't terminate and kind of get sliced off. No, the Father is eternally speaking. It's the very act of speaking that word, which we call the productive or generative act. And the Father speaks that word precisely because he's in a position as the the, the independent termination of the divine being from no one and from nothing else prior to all other things, he's in a position to speak a word eternally and continuously, unceasingly, because he knows. Whereas in a created intellect, we speak in order to know. The memory speaks or the soul speaks appropriated to the memory uh, moving out towards understanding in order to know it forms a concept in order to know so there's imperfection at its beginning imperfection at its medium and imperfection in its return through love but nevertheless we see once we remove imperfections we can see then oh well memory intellect and will kind of map on to how it must be for not just god the father to have possess perfect memory intellect and will but also for god the father through perfect intellect and will to also through a generative act through a productive act which we primarily springboard from on the basis of scripture to then see that from memory there's a notional or originative act according to nature which terminates in the eternal speaking and begetting of the word but because it's an infinite communication from a perfect person that's primordial to a second person that also possesses that same nature by very fact of that uh, communication or the communication of that same nature, then that that relationship of speaking and and imaging is eternal, even though they're distinct terms. And then mutatis mutandis to the spirit, we have the same kind of relationship only according to the mode of will. So you know, I don't know if that exactly gets to your question, but I think it certainly is a motivation in the Franciscan tradition to see. Well, we don't arrive at three distinct hypostases because there's no there, there's an infinite perfection in those actions but nevertheless we can see three really distinct and what i mean by really distinct is formally distinct objectively distinct powers that are still identical to the one soul so also in god we can see oh well if this is perfect well then there will be distinct terminations but yet all three of these distinct terminations from the father to the son through the son to the spirit are also really identical to the one divine being and so there's a, there's a stronger analogy and correlation there. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Um, when when you remove those imperfections from the analogy, it maps back to the Trinity, and I think it's a wonderful uh, tool 
of teaching the the you know the the doctrine of the Trinity. It's it sounds much more Augustinian to me. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like where where you're going, and and as representing uh, the you know Franciscan tradition on the filioque way, it sounds like uh, it sounds more Augustinian in emphasis. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes. It is, it is more Augustinian in emphasis, in my opinion, and insofar as I understand, uh, just simply because it takes the psychological analogy very seriously and, and, and affirms that it's a robust kind of analogy that kind of maps on pretty closely uh, once you remove the imperfections. And, and for the Franciscans, they were happy to do this because they already had St. Anselm. And St. Anselm distinguished between perfections that imply limitation imperfections even though manifested or realized or instantiated in an imperfect mode nevertheless considered abstractly don't imply imperfections and those what are what he would call spiritual perfections now you can have any number of spiritual perfections but only two kinds of perfections or operations or energies or activities are inherently productive and those are intellect and will and both proceed from the fecund mystery and so the Franciscans, yes, are very Augustinian in the sense because they're happy to say there is, there's a close correlation all the way up and down, whether you're talking about the soul or you're talking about the soul's power or you're talking about the divine being considered kind of abstractly or, you're consider, or you consider the, the modes of procession or in origination or productions of the persons of the spirit from the father, there, there's a mapping on as long as you're willing to make distinctions about what you're talking about, whether or not you're talking about person, whether you're talking about nature uh, and so on and so forth. If you make those distinctions, it, it maps on closely in different ways. And so, yeah, the Franciscan is, is, the tradition is very Augustinian in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that's very great. Uh, just moving a little bit to a, a something separate here, uh, you know, we spoke about the um, the movement from memory into uh, the image of intellection, and then from there you have like a sort of conjoining of volition of of will. Now, how would the Franciscans, uh, or in your understanding? Uh, extend an olive branch to the Orthodox, who are going to want you know they're 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 already going to throw a, a a red flag um, at this conjoining mm -hmm. of memory and intellect mm -hmm. and, and that image from which the will proceeds. They're going to say that you know paternity the 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 power to spirate the Holy Spirit or the originative act, as you called it. The originative act of the Holy Spirit is so subsumed exclusively in the paternity of the Father, his hypo, you know, his hypostatic property as the cause. Yeah. That when you have this almost like a merging of memory and intellection, that now you're sort of abrogating that unique distinctiveness. How would you extend an olive branch? To, well, or, yeah, goodness. I, I, I think my olive branch might, you know, have a little, a few of the branches and leaves removed because it would, might function more like a switch. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there is truly an olive branch to be ex extended is one in the first place, the Franciscans with the Orthodox affirm the radical and unique priority of the father. So whereas St. Thomas will say the Father gener the father generates because he is a father. The Franciscans will say, no, no, no. No, the, the, the father is the father because he generates, meaning that it's not the subsistence or opposed relation that is, is, is in first place. Rather, it's the unique aseity and inseity of the eternal father possessing from no one else and in its fullness, the divine being. So the divine being that the father possesses is perfect. So the father of himself has is is perfect intellection, perfect volition, and he and he, and he receives that from no other. Um, <clears throat> and then the second point, I guess, the second olive branch would be given the fact that the Franciscans, in a sense, through you know the application of uh, a nested distinction, you know, they affirm that there are subsisting opposed relations, but these subsisting opposed relations are in a sense less central or less interior to the distinction of persons than the mode of emanation 
so far that while Bonaventure kind of hedged and went back and forth, it's very clear that his immediate and best students in the next generation, John Peckham, uh, future Archbishop of Canterbury, as well as Matthew of Aquasparta, erstwhile secretary of Boniface VIII and probably the ghostwriter of the uh, notorious or perhaps glorious, uh, depending upon your perspective, uh, Unum Sanctum, both conceded that the modes of origination or emanation are sufficient to determine the production and distinction of persons. Now, this is very important because then the Franciscans can concede that the filioque is not counterfactually required for the distinction of persons. So we say, yes, the father is unique in this sense because he possesses first and of himself the, 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 the full ability to generate and spirate. There's, there's, there's no question. Um, <clears throat> So I think those are two important olive branches. And then we need to, then we would have to move into the discussion then of what we mean by one principle, how we name principle, what we mean by causality. Is there a way in which causality can be extended while preserving the identity of the principle of operation uh, to speak of the filioque? And those are things that I think the uh, Synod of 1285 makes very difficult. But I think that when, when one reads that Synod, it's, you don't see you see certain denials taking place, but you don't see the same kinds of distinctions that Franciscans make legitimately or illegitimately. Uh, so, so for example, you know, when one says that the father uniquely possesses the um, power to generate and spirate, I would say, sure, yes, he uniquely possesses this, but does it follow that he exclusively possesses it? Because if you affirm that the father spirates, that means then the father, by definition, in being constituted as father must already have a son. And if he has a son and you already specify that the father, any nature, this is coming out of Chalcedon, this is coming out of uh, uh, Constantinople III, this is coming out of Lateran 649, this is the essence energy's distinction, the essence operations distinction. Every nature operates and manifests itself in and through energies. But the person of the father possesses the common nature uniquely. But the father operates, and here's a distinction that I don't see many uh, Greek Orthodox or Greek theologians making, and it seems lacking or absent in the uh, Synod of 1285 with Gregory of Cyprus, is that there's not a clear distinction between a principium or cause, quod, which refers to the hypostasis, the person, the ultimate term of reference for any action, and the principium quo, that by which the person operates because clearly the father cannot have perfections that pertain to nature per pertain to the perfection of div divinity and deity as such that the son and the spirit don't have because then that would mean he's a greater being by nature than the son of the spirit so he must possess the divine nature and then operate energetically through that divine nature but if you say that the father is the father of the son and it's the father that spirates he must already be the father of the son in some logical priority and then the father generates principium quod through his perfect infinite nature namely the originative productive act of intellection or generation depending upon if you want to go damasidian or augustinian that means then that that energy or nature through what he's through which he's acting is terminating in the sun. But in that termination, the generation is a perfect communication. And so because of the perfect communication, the productive act is perfected according to generation. So it would be superfluous. It would in fact be impossible for there to be another sun generated. Why? Because the perfection of the generative productive act is exhausted in the termination of the sun. This is the perfect image. But insofar as that nature is communicated through that act, the father is also originating the spirit, but nevertheless, the termination of the spirit cannot be in terms of the psychological analogy and according to the Franciscan school, cannot be prior to the termination of the sun. And so if the sun terminates, the sun is in a quasi potential position with respect to the reception of the power of spiration that the father possesses primordially and originatively as, as received from the father, the son is still in his termination as son in a position relatively prior to the termination of the spirit. But it's the father precisely operating through the perfection of nature because that's the only perfection the father has 
naturally, and it's the nature through which and the energies through which the father operates that is communicated to the son. But the son is then possessing that same nature and that same power, that same originative power of spiration as coming from the father and together with the father through that same one principle, that same one power, because you name uh, operations by their forms and they both possess the same form and nature, they will be one principle, the father as originatively and the son as uh, generatedly terminating in the Holy Spirit via this motive of volition and this productive power of spiration. And so this is where I think the Franciscan maybe would push back against the Orthodox and say, well, wait a second, if, you are, if you're affirming taxis and you're affirming essence energy's distinction, and you're affirming that the son is fully divine except for paternity, and paternity exhausts itself in the generation of the son, well, then the son receives whatever the father has. And if there's a taxis, that termination of the spirit as the spirit of the father already presupposes in some ontological or logical priority that there's a termination of the son. And thus the son will terminate the divine being prior relatively then the Holy Spirit will be the termination of the divine being. And so, uh, you know, that's that's how the Franciscan would, would say, well, you know, you're still kind of stuck with difficulties because if you speak of eternal energetic manifestation of the spirit through the sun, well, eternal energetic uh, even manifestation, those are all nature terms. Those are all nature terms bespeaking energies. They're not bespeaking personal characteristics because the personal characteristic of the father is simply paternity, it's generation. The personal characteristic of the son, qua son, is passive filiation. The, 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 the personal characteristic of the spirit is simply spiration. You're not speaking of uh, simple perfections of nature here, because if that were the case, each person would have a perfection distinct from the other persons, and none of them would be perfect. You would, you'd fall into tritheism. Uh, you know. Yeah, one of them would be superior to the others. That's right. So, so you know, the Franciscans can go pretty far in admitting the priority of the Father and the sole um, originative principle of the Father. But once you start working out the productions themselves, certain certain things also seem to follow. And so, you can't you can't appeal to a distinction between essence and energies in order to ex explain the denial of the filioque, because you have to borrow terms that are nature terms, namely energies, eternal, energetic, um, manifestative. These are all nature terms. And the son possesses that same nature. You know, the, fa the father doesn't possess these perfections of nature uniquely. He just, he just possesses the divine being absolutely and asse, or in an asseitous manner first, but then he, through his acts of productions, he communicates. And if you admit a taxis of persons, then you seemingly would also need to admit at least a per filium uh, notion of the filioque. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's in a sense the, the, the Franciscan line on that. And I, you know, I happen to agree with it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I, I have never even heard of that before. Um, that, you know, that, uh, you know, taking, taking from that point of view where, yes, the powers of uh, generation and spiration are in the Father alone, but because the Son and the Holy Ghost are consubstantial with the Father, we can't exclusivize certain things on the Father uh, without then making him a different being. Yes, or, yes. Or yeah, if you, if you say paternity, filiation, and spiration are pure perfections, then you're confusing nature with person, just like what St. Bonaventure and St. Maximus says is the, is the, the, the first error. As St. John of Damascus says, this is the key error of all the heretics, to confu confuse nature and person. But if you say the Father has perfections that the Son does not have or the Spirit does not have, then you are confusing nature and person, and you're saying that each person would have a perfection distinct from the other per persons that would make them more or less or differently the divine being. And, you know, one thing to tack on to this is, you know, if you say, and I'm, I'm going back a, a, a several minutes, but I wanted to cash this out in terms of the two perfect principles of production is if you say the father relative to the son in generating the son in communicating the divine being to the son exhausts generation so there can be no more generations because it's perfect by the same reasoning the father in so far as he spirates the spirit whether from the son or through the son or independently of the son 
exhausts the power and per, the the generative or productive power of of spiration precisely because again it's a perfect termination of a perfect act so when people ask why don't why don't why isn't there more gods why don't you need more productions well you don't need more productions because only two perfect the 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 capacity and possibility for such productions right. i think that's an important thing to bring up Yeah, I was just saying, and, and, and to your point, uh, and how can you go beyond what's already perfected? You know? That's right. Yeah. 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 That's excellent. I don't have any more questions. Michael, if you want to take over. Yeah, I have just a couple, and then we're going to get to some chat questions. So could you maybe briefly um, uh, explain to us Damascene's understanding of the filioque way? Um, does he have an understanding of the filioque, or does he have material that would seem to exclude an understanding of the filioque? Does he affirm it? Does he deny it? Well, I mean, what, what's his view on this? Well, it seems, yeah, it seems clear that he denies the filioque in the sense that uh, Augustine or um, St. Thomas or St. Bonaventure, blessed Duns Scotus, would, would affirm it. I mean, he says very clearly that we do not say the spirit is of the sun. Um, and, you know, sadly, St. Thomas's uh, account of this is, well, you don't have to listen to, to John of Damascus on this point. Why? Well, because he was before, he was before the, 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 the clarification of the question, and also he was influenced by Nestorians on this point, because it was a common line all the way up into uh, the 17th, 18th centuries, at least as far as my reading, to, to see that the first denial of the... Uh, <clears throat> procession of the spirit from the sun was made by Nestorius and um, his disciples and confreres. And so many people just took that in the West, at least, as an indication of its heretical provenance. And anybody who denied the filioque is simply a Nestorian heretic on this point. Um, but he does, he does seem to, and it's difficult for me to actually pin down uh, St. John of Damascus on this question. It does seem clear that he does not want to affirm uh, the filioque in the sense that we mean it. Um, does he come close to affirming what St. Maximus maybe affirmed in terms of the perfilium? Uh, I don't know, but it's, it, it does seem to me that says that where he speaks of the, um, procession of the spirit coming to rest in the sun or the manifestation of the spirit through the sun as the sun manifests itself through rays, uh, that seems to be suggestive of more explanation. But with St. John of Damascus, and I, I, it's been a while since I've read the text or taught the text, uh, if memory serves, he, it's, it's, he doesn't really go beyond this. And he, he provides the formula. We don't say uh, of the son with respect to the spirit, uh, but um, it's possible that this doesn't serve as an absolute denial of the filioque. Many people would argue that it was, and you know that's fine. I, I they're probably right. Uh, it could also be that he is saying, "Well, we don't use this language because it's dangerous, or it smacks of heresy, or it suggests that the Father is not the sole origin of of um, the Spirit." So I, I I can't explain Saint John of Damascus on the filioque because I don't think he actually articulates a doctrine of the filioque, and it's difficult at times to tell when and whether he's talking about theology proper, namely uh, the Trinity, or uh, eco the economy, uh, the, the Trinity ad extra. Uh, but, you know, totally totally beside the point, but related, is it, it would be an interesting study to look back at, uh, say, uh, the Council of Constantinople, and what was affirmed in terms of the procession of the Spirit from the Father, in both in terms of its positive affirmation, because clearly, Affirming that something is the, the spirit is from the father is not contrary or contradictory to saying the spirit is from the son. It, it's simply not. It doesn't work out logically that way, but it could be intending that, a negation. But what's interesting is that in the formulation of the creed, the additions with respect to the procession of the spirit at Constantinople, the dispute precisely came about because both Macedonians and Eunomians were saying that the spirit came from the son and the spirit was therefore a creature. But that seemingly wasn't particularly denied. It seems it, it could almost be read as though there was a common assumption 
that the spirit was from the son, but we wanted to deny that the spirit was a creature. So we had to say the spirit is from the father. And that was what was inserted into the creed. And thus, when when you look at this, it's, it's, it's an interesting research project. And perhaps the scholarship has all shifted and everybody knows better these days. But if you read, say, 17th century uh, discussions of this question, this is exactly what they go to. They go to the issue with the Eunomians and the Macedonians and the fact that every, both of the heretical groups seem to have affirmed that the spirit comes from the sun. And the, the, the answer or response of the council was to say, the spirit comes from the father and thereby coming from the father as the unique source, the divinity as such, therefore the spirit is divine. It doesn't necessarily imply a negation. Um, you know, this is this is just food for thought, but it, it's an interesting historical theological question uh, to to raise. Is actually what were the common assumptions and the uh, the the disagreements between the Orthodox side and the uh, Eunomian and Macedonian sides at Constantinople? Now, you also uh, br briefly talked about the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit and mentioned Gregory of Cyprus. Could you maybe um, elaborate further and also not, not only explain to us what the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit doctrine is, but could you answer, is it compatible with the Franciscan understanding of the filioque? Well, I, boy, I've read, I've read uh, uh, Papadakis' book, um, <clears throat> And I, would, I wouldn't want to venture into explaining what the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit is, because I'm not sure what it means other than that there's an eternal manifestation through an energy of the Father that terminates in the Spirit, but the Spirit in its termination is being manifest through and in the person of the Son. It sounds similar to St. John of Damascus's formulation. Uh, the question I would have then is, by what energy or what nature with energy is the father acting and how does this distinguish him from the son? So I wouldn't want to go into the dogmatic or metaphysical account of the eternal manifestation because I'm not sure what it means um, with respect to the procession of the spirit and the spirit's relation to the son. Half of me wants to say it's filioque, denying the filioque without sufficient distinctions that the Latin tradition possesses. Um, and the other half of me wants to say, well, clearly they're explicitly very upset with the filioque and they, and they want to deny all causality um, to the son. And so this is clearly incompatible. But my, my continual question to the orthodox side of the debate is, I'm not sure what is being preserved here. Um, is it the unique source of the father? Is it just simply a denial of the... Um, uh, the seeming implications of the taxes or order of persons. Uh, what What is at issue here? And to me, certain distinctions and language in, say, uh, Papadakis' uh, appendices that contains the um, Thomas of 1285, they, they, use, they use language, uh, it uses language, such as the father and the son constitute, stand together as one principle. I'm not sure what constitute means in that language, and it could be a translation issue. Uh, but also, they, there's there's language of the father and the son participating in, or or sharing in, but participation is worse, um, sharing in the production of the spirit, the spiration of the spirit. Clearly for the Franciscan and Latin tradition, and I think the bulk of the Greek patristic tradition, uh, there's no participation in God at all. God simply is God, subsisting in three persons from the father to the son and, and through the son in the spirit. There's no such thing as participation. So when I read this language from a condemnation of Latin positions, and then there's never a distinction in causality or principle between say the principium quod and the principium quo, my, my, my suspicion is, is they don't really fully understand the, the development and subtlety in the Latin scholastic tradition, which of course isn't original with the Latin tradition. It comes from St. Sophronius of, uh, of, 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 of Jerusalem, um, St. John of Damascus, St. Leontius of Byzant Byzantium. I mean, this is, these methods were used, but the sophistication certainly reached a new level in the uh, Latin Middle Ages. And when I read condemnations of the Latin position, which fail to avert to or recognize the distinctions within the Latin tradition and then give uh, more general sweeping condemnations, I think, well, maybe you're not really hitting the target. And that's, that's kind of where I'm at on that, as I'm not sure they're even talking about the same thing because they speak in language that the Western theologians would never speak of. 
you know, there's no such thing as participation. Uh, two persons constituting one principle, that's not, that's not Latin thought. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know exactly what to say about that issue. It's, it, it, it's something that merits more thought and discussion. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have a question here that looks really, really good. I want to ask this. This is from, um, he was actually on our show before Vitalis. Um, he, he says non, uh, it's a non filial oh, yeah, question, yeah, yeah. but it, it's a non filial question, but I think it's well worth asking. Uh, SCOTUS don't make the essence and energy. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. SCOTUS don't make the essence existence distinction. Would that not be more important in dialogue with Palamism than formal, ex uh, distinction? Could you comment on that? SCOTUS don't make. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this thing. This has to do with this has to do with uh, constitution of essences, and so in the finite realm, they don't make a real distinction between essence and existence because they see uh, the the notion of existence as simply the perfection, the the mode, the modal intensification or perfection of a particular essence, and so to make a real distinction for Scotus is is nonsensical because he doesn't see existence as you know parcelled out by essences. So you have like a, a, a generic notion of existence, and then these finite essences contract this kind of common uh, bank of, Ephesus, uh, of, of, of existence. It's not, it's not simply there's existence and then there's contractions of existence. No, rather, essence is given priority, and the perfection of a given essence is that it terminates as a really existing supposit or hypostasis in a perfect mode of existence. Um, <clears throat> and so the, Scotus will make a formal distinction between essence and existence, but he can't make a real distinction between essence and existence because they consider uh, the relationship of essence as terminating or subsisting independently, and that's what they call existence, or they say, well, there's existence, and then it, it receives through um, the process and interaction of generation and corruption, form and matter, a contracting form that then parcels out this existence and makes it concrete and individual. Uh, and so that, I don't, know, I don't know exactly how that would relate to the Polemite question, because in, in God, in either case, the Polemite or the Scotistic articulation, um, if you make a distinction between essence and existence, it cannot be real in either account. And also with St. Thomas, there's not a real distinction in God between essence and existence. He is pure existence. Um, whereas in the created realm, that's where uh, Thomas and Scotus would differ on the, the nature of the distinction between essence and existence. Hmm. This one is, uh, let me see, I had it and it just moved. Uh, there it is. Uh, Hercule Flambeau. Uh, what would you wish a layperson uh, understand about the filioque? What's the biggest thing you would want for them to take away from this? I think uh, two points. One is, one is that there is a, a, a unity that is preserved in the filioque uh, in terms of the imminent trinity because the father in the taxis of persons communicates the entirety of the divine being minus fatherhood and without or having already actualized the productive power of generation so it it, it preserves and in a sense uniquely encapsulates i think a western concern for the full divinity of of the uh word the, the the Nicene Homo Usias. I think that's a, that's an important thing, and you know, I think this is the these the next question is a, a bit farther flung, because it goes into uh, working out uh, ramifications of a of a theological position or a metaphysical position that is not immediately apparent and perhaps doesn't need to be media immediately apparent or perhaps doesn't follow uh, inexorably logically from a stated position. Um, you know, you see certain orthodox saying, you know, the filioque is the cause of the demise of everything we know good about society and Western civilization. And it collapses into a rank form of monism or pantheism. And it's all from the filioque, all from this uh, clause inserted into the creed in the ninth century or so. And, you know, I would perhaps turn the table and say, what we say what St. Thomas noted 
And St. Bonaventure noted, and I'm not saying I would live or die by this, but it certainly is food for thought given the wisdom of these two figures, is that, okay, if you want to ass uh, assert from a certain more extreme um, Greek position that the filioque is the cause of all the evils in the world, well, that's an arguable point. And, you know, we have to go down many rabbit holes and along many trails before we might assent to that. But it's a, it's something to consider. It's certainly a shocking statement and should cause one to think. But on the other hand, both St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure affirm that if you deny the filioque and the eternal procession of the spirit per filium, then this will have ramifications in the economy that have to do with the unity and visibility of the ecclesia, namely the church. And so if you deny filioque, you end up raising the question of whether or not spirit and son are always essentially united in one church, one visible church. And they saw this essentially as uh, an economic Trinitarian or, or um, a problem in the economy with respect to orthodox ecclesiology is that you can have a pneumatocentric ecclesiology and spirituality that doesn't um, that doesn't necessarily have the incarnational visible institutional and iconic um, reality and stability that uh, the filioque would would suggest so I I would say you know it's it's important insofar as understanding the 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 father and his relation to the son and the spirit the the unity of the divine being and perhaps bonaventure and thomas were onto something or perhaps they were just making polemical points but it certainly does get one cause one to think uh about the nation the the nature of the filioque and its relation to our ecclesiology this one is a uh, question from email how is it uh, i'm sorry how is the son not also the co-father of the holy spirit is it simply because the procession is not a filial one i.e a semantic distinction well no it's not it's not merely a semantic distinction because the modes of generation and spiration are essentially different and so generation is a natural mode of operation which will terminate in a likeness or an image or a son whereas uh, spiration is not according to the mode of nature or generation, and rather terminates not in a likeness per se, but in uh, a gift or what uh, Augustine and Bonaventure would call a bond. And so the mode of its procession and the nature of its termination is not to be a likeness, it's rather to be a nexus or a unifying uh, principle relating, relating father and son, and thus manifesting uh, the love of the father and the son as terminating hypostatically in a distinct person. So it's not it's not merely a semantic difference because the two modes of origination and emanation are irreducibly distinct. And that's something that is at least hinted at uh, in terms of our analysis of human powers of, of, of spiritual operation, is that intellect and will are irreducibly distinct modes of operation and activity. This one is from uh, Alex Plato. Um, is the Franciscan metaphysic the best way, or is Franciscan metaphysics the best way to bring real unity between Orthodox and Catholic on the filioque, and if and why, if so? Well, it's hard to say what what the best way is. Um, I certainly think it has the most potential to to further discussion, uh, but I think I. So I think, yes, it's emphasis on the prim priority of the father, the, the modes of emanation as, 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 as the fundamental way in which the persons are distinguished. Those are, those are very auspicious in dialogue with uh, orthodox dogmatic theology. But I think what still needs to be uh, considered and perhaps would be more helpfully considered, assuming that we can enter into conversation and the Franciscan tradition can be brought alongside the Thomistic tradition and the Orthodox uh, articulations or the variations thereof of, of the articulation of the Trinity for the sake of, uh, of achieving unity. I think what first needs to be done is a much more careful study of just how Orthodox condemnations of Latin positions work. Uh, because in my reading of Orthodox Latin cond condemnations of Latin positions, I find them not making distinctions that Latin theologians and theology makes, or at least theologians make, that would be helpful. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure ever, other than the we deny the filioque, I'm not sure their target. 
Uh, so I'm A, not sure what they're trying to preserve, and B, not sure what they're condemning because they're not speaking the same language. They're not using the same concepts and making the same distinctions that Latin theologians make. And so it could be an issue of we're just simply talking past each other. Uh, it, it clearly could be the case that St. Thomas, and I think it probably is the case, that St. Thomas's theory of subsisting opposed relations being the sole constitutive ground of distinction of persons that probably won't fly um, given orthodox dogmatic theology. However, a Franciscan approach is perfectly amenable to that kind of position. It's just then it becomes a little bit more important to discover, well, how are we using distinctions? How are we understanding causality? Clearly, there's no notion of participation, sharing, uh, con constituting. I mean, all of this language, uh, we're, we're just, Franciscans don't think in those terms, and neither do Dominicans for that matter. So, so yeah, I think uh, the condemnations have to be better clarified, and the Orthodox need to better understand what was actually being affirmed um, in Florence and in Lyon, and perhaps even, uh, what was it, Lateran? Three or four, letter and four, I believe. This one is from Kiss Dog. He uh, says, in terms of what the Eastern Orthodox are trying to maintain, is this matter not really one of authority, and thus the Eastern Orthodox preserving the in council creedal uh, formation pattern? Is it all really about ecclesiology? <clears throat> well, yeah, that, that's an important question, and it's a good question because there's a dispute, obviously, about what it means to add to the creed. Um, after Constantinople, there was nothing to be added to the creed. And the Latin position is simply that, well, that addition is an addition by negation, something that denies what's in the creed, but not uh, it's not an addition in the relevant sense if it's meant to clarify. Uh, the orthodox position tends to be otherwise. Um, and that's that that's an interesting historical discussion, but there is there is the issue of the authority to unilaterally add to the creed. And obviously, what is the justification for adding to the creed, at least in terms of uh, Catholic apologetics? Well, it's papal authority vis-a-vis -vis general councils. Um, clearly, a pope can't be bound by a pope, except insofar as it pertains to the faith. And a pope can't be bound or limited by a council in terms of its uh, prescriptions. Certainly, a pope can add or clarify. Uh, that's the Catholic position. So it is very strongly rooted in ecclesiological issues. But nevertheless, I think the formal nature of the discussion still has to do particularly with this question of the nature of the procession of the spirit, the nature of the the, the spiration of the spirit. And I think as it stands on the books, there is an irreconcilable dogmatic difference, at, le at least in terms of conclusions. And my way forward would be to suggest that perhaps a certain misunderstanding indicated by language that Catholics wouldn't use about um, the production of the spirit, as well as fewer distinctions, perhaps a less developed apparatus of philosophical and metaphysical and theological distinctions in the East would create misunderstandings or at least lend themselves to misunderstandings of Latin articulations of a similar position. So it does seem to me that A, yeah, at least verbally, formally, we are at a doctrinal impasse that is not merely ecclesiological, but that doctrinal impasse perhaps admits of further discussion clarification. Um, and then we need to go back to the issue of the insertion of the filioque into the creed. And I think that's it's perfectly acceptable and uh, correct, at the very least, to not require the filioque of uh, Eastern Christians who haven't recited it in their history. Uh, that's a far cry from denying that the filioque can be true in any sense. This one is from Elijah. Is the Thomistic filioque I, uh, reconcilable with the Franciscan filioque? Oh, was that? Oh, did, yeah. Um, did you have something there, Eric? Well, I, I I just wanted to say that uh, I just wanted to know what. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I agree. Is, is my audio coming through? Okay. Um, yeah. I, I you know this whole issue of ecclesiology. You know, yes, there's somewhat of a ball in our court when it comes to the issue of the word addition in the creed, especially given uh, some recent discoveries in history with Constantinople 879 and 880. Um, but would you also agree, Dr. Goff, that there's another ball 
in the court of the Eastern Orthodox um, in their understanding of ecumenical councils, given that at the Council of Florence, uh, they agreed to the proceedings and to and and, and to you know all the, there was uh, uh, you know everyone except for Mark of Ephesus uh, and, and 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 we have to we have to say that the Patriarch John of Constantinople uh, was dead. Um, so minus the Constantinopolitan Patriarch, every one of the Greeks there minus Mark of Ephesus signed on to the, the decrees. And then following years later in Constantinople, I want to say it's Macedonius or Metrophanes. I can't remember the, the successor of John in Constantinople, but he upheld the decrees of Florence. And I think so did his successor. So do you think there's somewhat of a ball in their court also on how to vilify um, a council of that stature? Boy, you, you're you're not asking exactly the right guy. Father Chris Capas would know uh, much oh. better than I would know. Um, yeah. I do think if, if everything you say is true, there would seem to be a kind of an about face that occurred, but that might be internally coherent or consistent with at least the orthodox understanding of ecclesiology at that time. Uh, it does seem very clear that at that time, however, at least from the Latin side, and it seemed to me from the Greek and well, generally Byzantine side, this was looked at an intramural kind of debate. So there was there was a rend in the church, but it wasn't necessarily a rending of the church itself into two irredeemably or at least irreducibly distinct realities. Uh, so if that if there is a presupposition of that sort, then you must say, well, on what just on what basis does one justify that assumption going into the council and then coming out of the council having accepted it? except for, you know, St. Mark of Ephesus, um, on what justification or what basis is that renounced? Now, clearly, this is not something that's absolutely determined in orthodoxy, at least with respect to what the nature of ecclesial authority uh, and or infallibility is vis-a-vis -vis the councils, um, and also what role reception has to play in um, the, exception, uh, the accepting of, of a council. So those are certainly open discussions, but I, right. I, I mean, from where I sit, it seems perhaps more germane. And this is, you know, kind of where Cardinal, uh, future Cardinal Bessarion was, is that, you know, he saw the, even notwithstanding the forgeries of St. Basil and all this stuff and really some, some bad acting. Um, and it, it, it's regrettable that, you know, perhaps the Franciscans never got to present the, uh, the, the discussion or lead the discussion on God. That's what they were sl sl slated to do at Florence. Um, but Basarion came over and he was a convinced, he was convinced that the Latin church was wrong. But when one sees the testimony of the West with respect to the procession of the spirit, and there is a strong filioquist reality, and there is arguably legitimate development, meaning an organic development and application and a working out of principles and implications with respect to the patristic teaching of Saint, say, Saint Hilary of Poitiers, uh, uh, Saint Augustine, especially his great De Trinitate. Um, it seems to me that one should recognize that just like Saint, just like Robert Grostesta, just like Saint Bonaventure, especially in his collations, although he could be not, quite nasty in his sentence commentaries, but also John, John Duns Scotus quoting, uh, Robert Gross Testa is that, you know, we can't say that the, the Latin fathers or the Greek fathers are those who are condemned as heretics. And if you find that the Latin church or the Latin fathers have a basically common approach, I think it's, it, it, it's only just that the Greek church recognized that this is not heretical. Um, and so I think maybe the ball is in their court on seeing, well, why do the Latins think this way about the procession of the spirit? And is it rooted in their worship and especially in the theological writings of the fathers. I mean, many people take Augustine on this point, you know, well, he's a great guy and he's, he's a blessing. He wrote beautiful uh, devotional and spiritual works like the Confessions, but when you when he gets into metaphysics, he's all washed up. Uh, I just say, well, I, I don't see how you can seriously apply that. I, I... Hmm. Okay. Uh, th this one was from Elijah. Um, is the Thomistic filioque reconcilable with the Franciscan filioque? Well, in terms of in terms of their conclusion, yes, absolutely. They both arrive at uh, an affirmation of the filioque. How they get there 
and the way in which they explain it, I know I think they're ir irreconcilable uh, precisely because they understand the um, <clears throat> the 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 status of paternity in the Godhead differently. Um, and they also understand the role of originations or emanations and subsisting relations uh, quite differently. And so I, I think as, a, as theoretical accounts, they're irreducibly distinct. But in terms of their uh, adherence to dogmatic teaching, they're one and the same. I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting thing. There are several, more than one way in which to articulate, um, you know, common dogmatic positions. Um, still looking for some questions. I think we might have a few more. Um, I saw one posted here just a little bit earlier. Let me uh, get to it here. Give me just one second. Hmm. Yeah, while he's looking for that, I just wanted to point yeah. out that uh, this whole issue of reception uh, in Orthodox thinking um, I have a number of books here you know, going through the survey of Russian Orthodox thinking, starting from Alexei Komiakov and uh, Ivan Kurovsky. Um, and, you know, there, there's been some pushback against that from uh, the other, mainly Greek theologians. You know, I know that, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, John Roman... Father John Romanides was not a fan of the reception theory that uh, you know Komikov was famous for, but mm -hmm. it, I do think it's a ball in their court, and it's I don't think it's something that's resolved yet. Yeah, I think I think you're probably I think you're right. Uh, I would just defer to uh, those with more knowledge <laughs> on that particular point. Um, I do have one more. This is a follow-up question from Alex. Uh, what do Orthodox need and Catholics need to do or say to make unity on this point real? Is Franciscanism the best way for it? Well, I think, I, like I said, I think the Franciscan approach is clearly in a position as an articulated and accepted, widely accepted and well-established um, theological and spiritual reality in the church. Uh, it has the most to offer in this partic particular discussion because it has so many, well, several key uh, points in continuity or in common with the uh, more Greek uh, Cappadocian approach. And so, yes, I think, I think in good faith moving into discussion, uh, the Franciscans can concede a lot. And in fact, positively and happily agree with uh, orthodox positions, especially with respect to the monarchy of the father, um, the counterfactual possibility that, or the counterfactual non-necessity that the uh, the Holy Spirit proceed from or through the Son, because the Father is a sufficient principle of Himself to spirate the Spirit. All of these are important things, and they can they can move us pretty far down the road. It's just a matter of the orthodox and Catholics coming together to understand, well, why did the Catholic tradition come to an affirmation of the filioque? Do we just throw out St. Augustine or do we somehow uh, allow him room? And is it the case as modern theologians are more likely to indicate that Augustine simply was wrong or is it the case as medieval Latin theologians were more likely to indicate that, that the Latin fathers, including Augustine and the Greek fathers, are not simply heretical. Uh, the second point is, I think, again, is a matter of the Greeks actually clarifying and demonstrating that they understand and are able to employ and still reject the Catholic position while accepting and assuming the distinctions that Catholics can avail themselves of through the either the Franciscan, especially the Franciscan, but perhaps even the, the uh, Thomistic tradition. Uh, several key principles and distinctions, I think, at least reading through uh, the, the, the tome of 1285 uh, indicates to me that they're not recognized or understood. And clearly because of language, uh, they don't understand the, the, the Western Latin position on this point. And so I, I suspect with SCOTUS that they're actually a lot closer together than they think they are, but because of a misunderstanding and positive formulations and anathemas, uh, it makes it, uh, there, there's a big barrier to get over.
and it, it will it will entail you know a pretty amazing um, alchemical you know and I, I, I I'm teasing uh, alchemical outcome to square these two or it will it will entail somebody saying well perhaps while what we're denying is correct we weren't denying the position we thought we were we were denying so uh, you know it could be analogous to the uh, joint statements of say the uh, Miaphysites and the Catholics, both East and West saying, well, we actually, we were, we were anathematizing heresy and true heresies according to our own theological system and language. But in fact, in reality, we didn't achieve or come to a meeting of the minds on the particular point. And so we don't necessarily by our anathemas under uh, exclude or anathematize the positions actually held by either party. Now, I, I make no judgment on the value of those, but it's 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 providing a type of a discussion that could take place. Whereas, wherein the anathemas are preserved, but understanding that the targets uh, were not actually existing in the same way as what was originally intended. So it's it's more of yes, there's a formal anathema, but yet the persons involved didn't actually understand. The, the position being anathematized in the precise way the anathema was intending the position to be anathematized. Uh, let's take one more. This one is from uh, Lord Have Mercy. Lateran Force seems to claim, I'm sorry, Lateran Force seems to equate the divine nature essence with three persons of the Trinity. What do we make of this? Equate the divine nature essence of the of of the three persons with the Trinity, could, is that what the question was? Yeah, the the claim is that Lateran four equates the divine essence with the three persons. In other words, the Father, the Father is the the Father is equal to the essence. The Son is equal to the essence, and and yeah. how does that? That's the question, basically. Well, yeah, distinguishing distinguishing between nature or essence and person. Um, yes, the Father is the divine essence and the son is the divine essence and the spirit is the divine essence insofar as each of these persons possess the fullness of, of of the deity and the essence itself is possessed in the father and communicated to the son and the spirit perichoretically to borrow a word from saint john of damascus um equally by the three persons in this reality of a common essence, but possessed by three distinct persons, possessing the, the essence in various modes. And so the, the father possesses it from himself and no one else. Uh, in fact, not even really from himself, he just possesses it. Uh, <clears throat> the son possesses it as generated and as being eternally generated by the father and the spirit possesses the divine being via the mode of communication in terms of spiration. So the, the essence of God simply is triune because each divine person possesses the essence. But that does not negate or collapse the essence into the persons insofar as the persons are distinct terminations of the divine essence in relation, meaning in relations of production, at least from the Father um, to the Son and to the Spirit, um, thereby instantiating a, a real distinction because each person is a termination independently of the one divine being. And so, yes, the Trinity is God and the Father is God, the Son is God and the Spirit is God. And this identification of the uh, Trinity with the divine essence is intended to speak of the unity of the one Godhead, but not in any way to collapse the distinction between nature and persons or between persons and persons. And so the point is here is that when you make this kind of identification, you, you can't have Father, Son, and Spirit, and then have deity that is like Father, Son, and Spirit all together, and you have a fourth thing. No, yeah. God simply is Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Spirit, and the Son is not the Spirit. Excellent. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, 
this has been very, very uh, thought provoking. I'm going to go back through and listen to it again. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you back on again with some follow ups. I'd love to have you on a second time uh, for another round with Dr. Bradshaw as well. So, uh, you know, everybody, y'all, y'all um, keep that in mind. Let me know if y'all want to see a part two of uh, Dr. Goff and Dr. Bradshaw. And we'll see if we can maybe arrange that if uh, y'all schedules are available. I'd like I'd like to also get a Thomist involved. Maybe uh, have a roundtable with all three. Still looking for one. So if anybody knows of a, uh, a Thomas willing to jump into that arena, let me know. Just uh, shoot me a message. But once again, Dr. Goff, thank you so much. This was excellent. I want to have you on again. Well, th thank you very much. Happy to do it. I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with uh, the conversation with Dr. Bradshaw, so I'd be happy to do that, too. Uh, are, are you still doing your lectures um, on your YouTube channel? I, I saw that you have some of your lectures available. Do you have any uh, new ones coming out? I don't. I haven't put any up for about a year, um, but I do have more that I that I could put up. It's, it's just a matter of actually doing it. Um, one thing that's probably in the works is I'm going to uh, embark on a 30 week Franciscan theology course with um, some of the uh, Franciscans of the Immaculate. So that's a big project. Well, so that's gonna be, maybe I'll post some of those lectures uh, be, yeah. once, we get, once we get to them. But I also have a full course on uh, post -Calc uh, well, Christology, Chalcedon and beyond, which is a much more historically textually rooted um, endeavor. And we look a great deal at um, the, the uh, Greek uh, patristic fathers from Chalcedon, especially up through uh, the seventh, eighth centuries. So some of those could probably be posted at some point. I think I heard some of your lectures on, on your YouTube channel with Christology, and I know there's some dogmatic ones on there too. So everybody check them out. Uh, give us the name of the YouTube channel. Oh goodness, I, <laughs> I think it's I don't Jay Goff. Uh, I, I'll yeah. put it in the description actually, but I want to say it's Jay Goff, but I, I have it saved as one of my favorites. But uh, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll definitely put that there so everybody can check them out. Like I said, there's Christology lectures on there, dogmatic uh, lectures. There, there's some church history lectures on there where you're talking about you know Palamas and some of his views. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. And his views. So all kinds of really really good stuff. And and these were actual lectures, I guess, that you were delivering to your students, correct? Yes, some of them were, yeah. And then there's there's also the Franciscan uh, philosophical tradition lectures that I've mm. put up there. Those were more free flowing and seminar type. But I have about, boy, I probably have about twenty five more of those to put up if if I ever get to it. <laughs> but please do because everything I've heard so far is, is just it's it's gold. So <laughs> as you. much as you can put up, please. I mean, and you're basically getting a seminary education here for free. So everybody check it out. Again, I'll put the description uh, or the link in the description uh, once this posts. But once again, thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Goff. Always a pleasure. Happy to do it. Thank you. And thank, thanks again for joining us, Eric. Yo, thank you for having me on. All right. And everyone, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this on your social media, and also go check out Dr. Goff's page. Until next time, God bless you all.